say hey, say who? Swinging at the plate, say hey, say who? Say Willie, that giant kid is great. When he hits the ball, it's long gone man. Hits it farther than camp he can. Swings the bat like a little lead pipe. When they reach the ball, it's over ripe. Say hey, say who? Say Willie. Say hey, say who? Swing it at the plate. Say hey, say who? Say Willie. That giant kid is great. He runs the bases like a choo-choo train. Swings around the second like an aeroplane. His cap flies off when he passes third. And he heads home like an eagle bird. Say hey, say who? Say Willie. Say hey, say who? Swing it at the plate. Say hey. Center like you have jet shoes. The other batters get the willy blues. Anything hit his way is out. Man, it just don't pay. Those guys do clout. Say hey, say who? Say willy. Say hey, say who? Swing it at the plate. Say hey, say who? Say willy. That giant kid is great. All right, everybody, welcome aboard to another edition of 1920 Negro National League Simulation. And a uh, special guest tonight is historian, author, Negro League history barnstormer, uh, Phil S. Dixon. And I'm going to get him on here. I wanted to, since it's Willie Mays's. 90th birthday today i wanted to uh to play that uh that song there you are phil welcome sir thank you so much willie mays's 90th birthday i'm sure you have uh, a couple of thoughts on that right oh absolutely so you know is he did i read that today he's one of only three rem three that are left from that actually had some time in the near leagues is that right it, well, it depends on it depends on what you call Negro leagues. Okay, we can get into that. <laughs> All right, so welcome, sir. I appreciate you taking the time. This is great. I've been looking forward to this. I think this is going to be uh, uh, a lot of fun. And you know, just to give everybody and 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 we've talked about this, but you know, I, I started this project um, just a, maybe six eight weeks ago, and and it was right around the time when. Uh, uh, it was getting towards, um, well, let me back up. In, in 2020, it was the 100th anniversary of the Negro National League. And then with the pandemic and a lot of the activities and festivities and everything that was going to be surrounding that uh, just didn't, uh, wasn't able to happen. So trying to do a reboot this year, uh, the Negro League Baseball Museum, Bob Kendrick, that Negro League 101. Uh, and so, you know, I just... This has fascinated me for a long, long time. We were talking before we went live here about, you know, uh, some connection that we actually had from 30 years ago. But um, it, this, I'm just trying to do my part here to get these stories out there and get you and and others like like uh, that have worked so hard on this for such a long, long time. And so many people don't know the stories, and and I think. Uh, it, it's important to get them out there, and, and and especially with you know the day and age and the times that we're going through is so similar to to, to 100 years ago. It's it's kind of, it really fascinates me as well, and uh, you know so this this streaming uh, you know this software uh, that I, I have is I'm trying to touch it a, a new audience, someone maybe who is not familiar with the history of the Negro Leagues, because to me, a lot of misinformation, a lot of, of, of information that is just not known. And, and just to get you guys out in front of a of a new crowd, I think would be great. So, um, you know, um, one of the things that I thought was fascinating, I'm going to throw it up and you can maybe talk a little bit about this. When Reggie Jackson did a... a uh, a uh, benefit in 1992. I was working for the Scranton Wilkesbury Red Barons at that time, and it was to benefit the Negro League Baseball Players Association, raise some money, raise some awareness. 
you were there. <laughs> Tell us about this a little bit. Yeah, uh, 1992, my book, matter of fact, I just happen to have a copy here. This book right here was The Negro Baseball League's A Photographic History. And it was my second book. It had just come out, and I was about to go and introduce it to the world. And so uh, we started uh, in Scranton. And so <laughs> I flew out to Scranton, and uh, uh, Scranton is where it all started in 1992 uh, with the tour. Uh, for the book, and I left there and went to New York and went over to, uh, oh man, where'd I go in that? I know I ended up in Cincinnati. Uh, I was in Philadelphia. Um, I was in New York for several days. Matter of fact, there was a black syndicated uh, black uh, program called Bob Law. Mm -hmm. Bob Law was the uh, announcer, and uh, the only syndicated black talk program in America. And I went in his studio there uh, in Queens. And we were on all night. So awesome. it was, it was I can't time just trying to introduce uh, these stories, same people I've been talking about for 40 years, and I just keep adding to the list. And it was kind of fascinating. Uh, things have changed quite a bit. I think at that particular time, there might have been 10 books out. But yeah. now, you know, there's literally hundreds of books. And uh, so, uh, you know, I'm just happy that I was able to participate in and I also want to thank you, Philip, for having me on the show tonight. Uh, oh, it's great. I think it's awesome. Nice yes. Talk, talk baseball. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. It blows me away that you were there and that was the first night. And and, and, and the, the fact that uh, here we are 30, it's almost 30 years ago. That was August 9th, 1992. I, I can't believe where time goes. And you have put on a lot of miles. And, and one of the things I want everybody to understand here. You know, you've done uh, not just uh, the the research and the writing, and and you you were a, a founding uh, co-founder of the Negro League Museum in Kansas City, but you did something that to me, I mean, it just was it fascinates me. Um, that barnstorming tour of the country. I mean, it was more than a country. You went to Canada as well, yeah. doing. Uh, you know, your talks, uh, I mean, how, what, what made you do that? And how many, you, how many states, city, I mean, 200 cities, I mean, you were everywhere, right? Yeah. Uh, it was 200 cities, 17 states. And then of course, uh, went internationally to uh, Canada. And you know, the amazing part is that I drove all of that. So you that drove? How, so how many miles? How, what are we talking here? How uh, many I miles? think, uh, I'm going to say in 2015, if, and that's one that sticks in my head, I had 35,000 miles. Oh, my that goodness I had gracious. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I would put together schedules from, you know, like the Kansas City Monarchs or the House of David or the Homestead Grays. And so what I would do is I would, pat, I would pattern the way I traveled in the way that they played. Sure. And so in the way that they traveled. So, for instance, uh, I had one span where I, I, I presented, I think it was like 14 times in 12 days. Wow. And so what I would do is uh, I would, uh, like, I think I started this one, that one in Council Bluffs, Iowa. And then, and then I left there. Let's see, where was I headed? I headed to Algona, mm -hmm. Iowa. So what I would do is I would speak in the evening and travel in the daytime to the next city. So I would speak. Go back to go look back to my hotel, spend the night. Next morning, get up and then go to the next city. So I I went from Council Bluffs, Iowa, over a 12-day period. Sometimes speaking twice a day. I might get a like a rodeo at, at noon, and then I speak at a historical society, the public library, and I did that all the way through South Dakota. Uh, stopped over at the Sioux Falls. Uh, uh, of course, I had been to Sioux City prior to that. But uh, then I went over to uh, Jamestown, Bismarck, Minot, and I went crossed over into Canada, and um, and uh, I was in Saskatoon, Regina, and uh, Estevan, right as you cross the border, and uh, and now you know what's the most remarkable part about that? I live in Missouri, in Delta, Missouri, right outside Kansas City. I had done that tour. I had been gone for maybe almost two weeks, I think 13 days, speaking every single day. Everything was so perfect that when I got in my car the next morning, 
the drive back to Kansas City, I, I have a friend, uh, Dave Kemp, a historian up in uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And I was going to stop by his house and crash there and then come on back to Kansas City. But I was so pumped up from that tour that I drove from Regina, Regina Saskatchewan to Belton, Missouri, nonstop. <sighs> Oh my goodness. I mean, and so, you know, that you probably, um, I, I've written, um, it, it's I, it just it's an interesting point you just made about making that same style of, of, of tour because I wrote, um, a screenplay years and years ago, and it, it involved something about the civil war, early baseball, a little bit of, of, uh, early Negro league baseball. And one of the things I did in order to get a feel for what it, it was like, was I put on a backpack and I walked around Manassas Battlefield in Northern Virginia in, in July because I wanted to know, you know, what these guys, you know, might have been experiencing when it was 98 degrees outside with, you know, 80 pound backpack on their back. Right. So so what you did, uh, man, that that's the that's the experience. Right. It's probably, yeah, it, <laughs> you know, it was it was uh, it was probably one of the most fulfilling things that I had done in this whole uh, genre of the Negro League baseball experience. We'll just say that. Amazing. But, uh, to go all those places. And, and then, you know, I saw things uh, differently after I came back out of that tour. Matter of fact, the first book to come out after I did the tour was the Dizzy and Daffy Dean Barnstorming Tour. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of what I learned from making these trips uh, came, it, it ended up, so in some ways, thought, thought wise in, in that book. Sure, sure. And so, uh, because I had a whole different understanding of what barnstorming was about, how exhausting it can be, um, how exciting it can be. Uh, and then the other thing is, I learned so much about the geography and the, all <laughs> the great things that America has to offer. Mm -hmm. For instance, I'll give you, like I, I went down to Mississippi. I was down in Mississippi. So, I'm coming back to Missis from Mississippi, so hey, I, I stopped by Tubalo to see Elvis Presley's birthplace, right? Or <laughs> I was up in North Platte, Nebraska, and I can go see uh, Wild Bill Hiccup's house. And of course, he's not buried there; he's buried in Golden, Colorado, on, on a kind of mountain. And I went to Golden, Colorado. So, there you go. Um, it, so you know, uh, oh man, uh, you know, uh, there was a uh, a black movie producer named Oscar Michaud. And Oscar Michaud, it was, uh, he's buried in Great Bend, Kansas, of all places. So when I went to Great Bend, I was by myself and I went out to the cemetery. And of course, I couldn't find anybody. It was kind of raining. So normally I don't take selfies, but the first attempt I ever made at taking a selfie was at his gravesite because like, no one was there and it was raining. So, but yeah, I just learned so much. And, and when I talk to people, all these things come into my mind. Uh, just about what I've experienced and what I've experienced in just doing this topic. You know, I did a lot of interviews early. We're talking about interviews I did in the early 80s. I mean, I can go pull off my shelf and I can listen to Chet Brewer talk for an hour right now or, or uh, Clint Thomas who played with Hildale. I can go listen to Clint awesome. Thomas. Absolutely uh, awesome. You know, and uh, so I can pull things off my shelf that people have never heard. And uh, so, it's it just been a, a wonderful experience, and for me, uh, believe it or not, it goes back to my childhood. That was what I was going to ask you at some point today. So yeah, tell us how what how did you get into what 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 was it that drove you to to these lengths? I mean, this is this is a passion for you. <laughs> so what what got you into it? Well, actually, believe it or not, it was the Beatles. <laughs> That's a long story. Let me tell you the story. Yeah, tell uh, us the story. 1964, the Beatles were the rage. I was in the second grade. Mm -hmm. And so I got caught up just like all the other kids. And I, and I started buying these Beatles, the Beatles cards. Pops had a set of Beatles cards. And I started buying those. And I, and I took them to school. And I made the mistake there because my teacher took the cards and said, these aren't uh, collectibles. These are toys. And she uh -huh. took my Beatles I'm in the second grade. She took my Beatles cards, never got them back. So I go back to the store to, to start buying some more Beatles cards, right? And those are the days where, you know, you get the five cent for a pack and you get mm -hmm. five cards and a stick of gum, right? Yep. 
So I go back to the store to buy some cards, and there's no Beatles cards. The only thing left is baseball cards. So I had kind of got a, a, an attraction to these cards, right? So I started buying baseball cards. And uh, by the time I was uh, 19 years old, I had over 100,000 baseball cards. Wow. So you and, were uh, a collector. <laughs> I was a collector, still am a collector. And, and one thing I might mention too, uh, not only did I have 100,000 baseball cards, now we couldn't buy them in a set back then. Mm -hmm. you, would, you know, you would have to buy them by the pack. I didn't know any magazine or anything like that you could buy them. So these were bought by the pack. <laughs> That's a lot of sticks of gum. <laughs> made to the store. That's a lot but of gum. <laughs> oh, yeah, a lot of gum, a lot of gum. As a matter of fact, Don Russ had some of the best baseball gum. Um, <laughs> well, they weren't baseball, uh, but the Mickey, uh, the monkeys, the monkeys. I've collected the monkey cards, and they were on <laughs> Don Russ. Had oh, my wonderful God. Wonderful gum. But, that is um, funny. <laughs> the, the interesting thing is that um, uh, I was, but at age 19, I had the 55 tops complete, the 56. Wow. I had the wife of Ted Williams. I had the 1961. Now remember, I only started collecting in 64. But what I figured out, and you know, I was really in love with these baseball cards, but I figured out that when teenage boys found out about girls, they didn't care about their cards anymore. So I just went and asked them that I have them, and they gave me their cards. So there you go. I, yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> so I have to thank the young ladies for that. So, but it, it you know, it was, it was an interesting time. You know, I can remember, believe it or not, uh, maybe you can check the price here while we're talking, but I can remember when the Hank Aaron rookie card was $25. Oh, I'm sure it's much more than that. Uh, Just a little bit. <laughs> let me take a look. I'll do, go ahead. I'll, I'll take a look at it while, while, we're, while we're talking here. Yeah, it was $25. And uh, when a guy was wanting to sell me one, and I said, you know, I didn't really need it, you know, because I already had one, but... Uh, he was trying to sell it to me for twenty five dollars, and at that time I was making one hundred thirty two dollars every two weeks. And uh -huh. I, said, I don't know, it's kind of stiff, you know. So I passed on it. That's you know, it's kind of an amazing story. But 20... you know, that that's what led me to the Nico League in nineteen seventy seven. I was uh, in Colorado, and we had organized a thing called the Colorado Car Co Baseball Car Collectors Club, and um, I had Gaudi Car. I had all I had all kinds of uh, baseball cards and but you know some of them you know you might have 10 or 15 of them so it's not really something that you know you're trying to collect but i went up there and it was a guy uh, his name was nubo and he was in denver and uh he had uh almost a complete set of the 33 gallery cards and he wow. didn't have some of the cards that i had and and so he tried to figure out what he could he trade me to get those cards <laughs> And uh, he happened to have an autographed uh, picture of Judy Johnson and Buck Linder. Now, I didn't know much about the Negro Leagues. I knew some things like people coming out of my neighborhood, like Eddie Dwight, uh -huh. who lived across the alley from me, who played for the Kansas City Monarch. I knew a little miscellaneous things like that. I knew about Ernie Banks coming from the Negro League. But I didn't really have an appreciation for the Negro League. So... Uh, I ended up trading about 15 Gowdy gum cards for autographed Judy Johnson and uh, this Buck Leonard. Now, it mm -hmm. probably sounds like the worst deal in the world. <laughs> but for me, that was the beginning. That was maybe not, it was either 1977, 78, right in there. And, um, and from there, I began to uh, start following on the Negro Leagues. And uh, so I, I will tell you this, I went back to Denver uh, on my tour and I, I was talking to a guy, uh, the other, uh, in Denver, uh, Bill Sports Collectibles. Bill was a part of, uh, Bill Visas. He was a part of that club way back in when. Mm -hmm. So anyway, when I went up there, I stopped at Bill's store. Best, the best car collecting store in Colorado. No, no doubt about it. But I asked Bill, I said, what happened to Nubo? He said, well, Nubo, uh, when the cards started going up in price, he just got burned out and quit. But here I am, you know, what, 40 years later? You're talking about the Negro League, so best deal in the world. I, it sounds like it. It sets you on a path that uh, it's funny how that happens, right? You you don't know what things get you on a path, but sooner or later, once you're on that path, you know it, right? You know this is what 
you're supposed to be doing. And it, it sounds like you've had uh, uh, 40 years. It, it, it's, it's awesome. I think it's awesome. I, you, you've yeah, interviewed. By the way, I still, I still have that Buck Leonard and Julie, Judy Johnson autograph picture. Yeah. Awesome. You know, you mentioned just a few minutes ago about having um, all of these interviews with these players. You interviewed how many players? Over 500 former New League players? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that that is just a that's like a treasure. That's like a national treasure to have some of that stuff at this point because there just isn't too many of these guys that are still with us. I mean it, it's just it's just fascinating. Twenty seven thousand dollars for a fifty four um, Hank Aaron. I would have thought it would have been worth more than that, but but maybe maybe it'll go up in value. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Well, I, I, I will mention that in the whole uh, in the whole hobby of Baseball car collection. Uh, there are a lot of things that are based on race, and racism oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. in that hobby. So I that, that. that'd be another conversation for another day. Absolutely. And, yeah. and, you know, being a person who was there from the beginning, uh, when baseball cars really took off, is a is a you know, uh, it gave me great insight. So. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked about your your barnstorming tour, and. Uh, I want to, before we, I, I want everybody to take a look at, at your books. I'm going to put them up so we can talk a little bit through uh, some of those. But one of the things I want to, I want to get your thoughts on. So, so I started this project with the, with the 1920 Negro National League being the, uh, the focus because it was a, you know, it, it wasn't the first attempt at a league, but it was the first one that, that, that stuck and became a, a significant, uh, you know, milestone in, in, um, Negro League Baseball. And one of the things I keep trying to stress to people, and, and you know, I'm sure you've run across this a th thousands of times in your travels, but uh, when I talk to people, the, because of the lack of information or misinformation or whatever you want to call it, right, some of it is, is more than that, but the, the, the thought that these guys were double uh, A, triple A talent, uh, to me, is just so wrong, because you know, they, this, they weren't playing in these leagues and, and barnstorming because they weren't capable of playing in Major League Baseball or in Minor League Baseball because they were shut out of there as well. They had the talent. They couldn't play because of, of the, the segregation at the time. And so trying to, def, you know, get through to people to make them understand because I, I run into it, you know, all the time where people think, um, well, you know, they're just playing against the local Legion team. Yeah, on some days because this was their job. <laughs> I mean, if they weren't making money, um, they went to the next town and they played. And then some were league games and some were not. And so it, 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 you can't put this 162-game schedule in your head and, and equate that to these times. It wasn't, it wasn't that way. Uh, and so 1920 comes along, and now we have a league. And, 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 and could you tell us a little bit about – because uh, I know you've written a book as well on on uh, uh, the Kansas City Monarchs uh, and Rube Foster as well. When they founded the Negro National League in 1920, the significance of that achievement and, and making that stick. Go ahead. Yeah. So, what what is that? What what was the the uh, the significance of that achievement of that 1920 Negro National League uh, founding uh, that finally stuck when Rube Foster finally made it go? Yeah. Well, you know what? It put Negro League teams on a different level, and I'll tell you the reason why. If you go back uh, pre 1920, and maybe let's go back to the turn of the century. If you look at newspapers to do research on black baseball teams, you'll find them under amateur or you'll find them under semi-professional. Mm -hmm. So they weren't even classified as high as the minor leagues, even though they were beating minor league and major league teams. Mm -hmm. So it's the mindset. And, and this is part of how racism can affect the way we think. Mm -hmm. So uh, by putting them in with the amateurs, Right. Even though there were lots of powerful white city professional teams, if you take a city like Chicago, Jimmy Cullahan's Logan Square, Jimmy Cullahan was uh, a manager of the White Sox. So he's organizing on uh, Chicago, up in Chicago. He has his Logan Square's team, and, and they're stocked full of ex-leaguers. Mm -hmm. And so 
Uh, they're playing good talent in certain places. But no matter how much you played or how much you won, because they were labeling you as semi-professional, you couldn't get the traction that you needed to be compared with, uh, uh, say, a national or American league team or even a minor league team on the national level. So when 1920 comes along and they organize their league, and now they have a schedule of games, uh, they have eight teams in the circuit, and they're playing against each other. And what they did was pretty much solidify that movement from being quote, called semi-professional to professional. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the biggest and most significant things that came out of that. Because the, the teams that came in were already organized. They were already playing ball. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Ch Chicago Giants, you know, that was Frank Lehman's team that was organized in 1910. Uh, Rube Foster came in with his American Giants that was organized in 1911. The Kansas City Monarchs were a new team, but Jay, Jay Wilkinson mm -hmm. and Tom Baird, uh, they weren't new to the game. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, the Cuban teams have been coming over since the turn of the century. So, mm -hmm. um, so, But it was that perception now that we have a league, a professional league, and we're operated – very similar to how the major leagues are operated. So originally they were uh, on trains and uh, they would uh, play so many of their league games, right? But the interesting thing is because there was so much money in these, quote, semi-professional games that they continued to play those games. And so people continue to use that against them to say that maybe you don't have a real league. But, but that's where the money was being made. So uh, you, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, if not for some of these small cities, and I, tell, I used to tell people that when I was on the 200 city tour, your city, you don't, maybe don't think you have a connection to any black history, but really you do because yes. you kept the Negro Leagues alive. Yes. And um, you know, it, it's interesting. So every every day, every, every single day, I try to do a, a something along those lines. I, I try to find... Something I do, you know, I do my little amateur historian type of digging. I, I go into newspapers.com or somewhere where I can find some, some, some piece of of the Negro leagues that touched, you know, someplace in Maine or in, you know, in, in Ohio or wherever it is, and send that out there, and just to give people that that um, to understand that it was everywhere. Go, you know, go find it. Odds are a team, a player, a tour, somebody passed through close by and, and was in your area. And, and here's the thing, and you just touched on it. Um, even though they weren't at the time playing in a, in a um, you know, organized league prior to 1920, uh, and even then, they only played 70 games in, in 1920 or 60-some. Some played less. <laughs> you know, they were, barn, they were barnstorming. They were barnstorming. games in the league. Yes, and but they, they were barnstorming. Altogether. Yeah, they were barnstorming beyond that because exactly. that's how they made a living, right? But I think, you know, what people have overlooked, and I don't mean you, I mean people in general have overlooked, the significance of the fact that the Negro Leagues were able to take professional baseball high quality baseball to a small town in Iowa or North Dakota or Oregon or wherever they took it where in, you know, we're talking 1920. This is not 2020 where I, I, I mean, even, even when I was a kid, I mean, growing up in, in, in Northeast Pennsylvania, I could drive two hours and I could be in, in, uh, in New York city. I could be in Philadelphia. I could be a few hours in Pittsburgh. I had, I could go to any game I wanted to. This was not the case in 1920. So when these teams came through, they were bringing that quality of baseball. And it, I think it grew the brand of baseball. It gave people an opportunity to see these guys play. And sometimes, sometimes when they toured, um, in these barnstorming tours, there were major league players who played, correct? That, yeah. that would play against them in some of these cities. So, these these small towns had a huge impact in growing the game to make it America's pastime, even though I don't think that the Negro Leagues have gotten as much credit for that as they probably should. Yeah, and, and you know, that's another reason why I took the 200 City Tour. Yep. Because not only do you get 
guys who are in the major leagues currently. Like, for instance, if when I was down in Pittsburgh, Kansas, I could talk about Don Gutteridge. Don Gutteridge, when I was a kid, um, collecting baseball cards, he was the manager of the White Sox, right? But in the 1930s, he was with the Gas House Gang in the late 30s. But but the interesting thing is, is a uh, ball player coming out of high school, before he signed, he's already playing against the Kansas City Monarchs. Mm-hmm. So you would get guys coming up, you get guys coming down from the majors, going up to the majors, coming mm-hmm. down from the majors. You get ex minor leaguers that would be in these towns, and uh, there, it, it's surprising how little people realize this history is out there. Mm-hmm. But you know, the thing was when I went on the tour, you know, I might go to somewhere like Trenton, Missouri, and some baseball fan he thought he knew a lot about baseball. <laughs> but then when I come there, I start talking about uh, the, the Negro League teams coming to Trenton and them playing the Trenton team, and then I could tell them about the Trenton team and who they were. This guy said, I, I thought I knew something until you showed up. <laughs> awesome, but awesome. but I, did, I did my homework, and like I said, I've been at it for a little while. So yes. I've been able to dig and, you know, dig without a time limit, a restriction. And, and, and be quite honest with you, I, I research and write every single day, mm-hmm. 365 days out of the year. Mm-hmm. It never is nonstop. That's how you get. That's how you get good at something, and that's how you know you really love something too, right? I mean, this this isn't like a job. This is, this is what this is who you are, what you do, and that that's that's what's awesome about it. You know, the the it, really, it, it's um, work, but it, it's work, but it's not a job. <laughs> right. It's, I mean, it, that's what makes it so much more uh, uh, fulfilling, right? When when you when you do these things, yeah. Uh, you know, I had I had Pete Gorton on the other day, and we we did a uh, a 1920. Uh, simulation of an actual barnstorming game between the Monarchs and Casey Stengel's All-Stars. And, you know, just to give people an idea of, of, you know, putting yourself into 1920 so that you understand what's going on here. So Casey Stengel is from Kansas City, which is, I don't think um, a lot of people understand that his name isn't Casey. That's just his nickname because he was from Kansas City for KC. But the... um, uh, Several other players on the team that were from the Pirates, the Braves, uh, some of the players that were on the Phillies that he was on at the time were on this barnstorming tour. And when you look at where they were from, as we looked at where these some of these players were born, some were from the Kansas City area. Some were many were from Colorado and California. So what you can assume happened here was the season ended in September and now these guys are on a train because there were no airplanes, there were no cars, there were no buses, probably on a train back to California for the wintertime. And they probably stopped over in Kansas City and Casey Stengel rounded them up. Or maybe they talked about meeting in Kansas City and playing this tour. But I guess they played the Monarchs three, four, five games after the season was over uh, in this barnstorming tour. And it was fun because it was it was the Musial brothers, Irish Musial and Bob Musial. Um, this was Bob Musial who was on those you know great Yankee teams of the uh, of the 1920s on the 27 Yankee team. Uh, he was only 23 years old at the time, so he's probably tagging along with his older brother. <laughs> and here they are uh, in in Kansas City playing against the Monarchs. And and so th- there you go, right? Kansas City didn't have a major league team at the time they had uh the kansas city blues i think were uh, uh whatever level minor league that they were the so AAA american association so the negro leagues brought major league baseball to kansas city in 1920 and and they probably brought it in many other cities i'm just using that as an example and that's i think to me is just been overlooked because the negro leagues did so much they were everywhere you, you talk about a guy like john donaldson who you know Pete's been digging for years on him. The number of the thousands of places he's played, thousands, <laughs> you know, thousands of games in literally thousands of cities all around North America. It, it, it's staggering, uh, you know, uh, the, the reach that they had and the significance of that. So I, I just think it's, it's, it's fascinating. Well, let me, let me talk a little bit about one of those games in that series. Now, you know, I've had the luxury of being around long enough that when I first started researching, I knew people who were at that game. No way. Oh yes, my I goodness. Did. That's awesome. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the big thing was, uh, uh, 
there was one game, Casey Stingle hit a home run and the Monarchs were defeated one to nothing. Billy Rogan was pitching. That's that right. And uh, uh, the old timers told me that who were there, they said that the umpire kept cheating, kept cheating. <laughs> and so finally, Billy Rogan just got fed up with it. He just threw the ball in there in case he hit a home run and was over. <laughs> but it, it came out of frustration with the umpire. Now, no the kidding. umpire, uh, during that time, there was a guy named Joe Rule, R-U-E, who ended up being a major league umpire. But he was umpiring the Monarchs games in 1920 here, here in the Negro National League. Awesome. So, but Kansas City had a good group of ball players that, um, that you know, like Cot Tierney was one of them. Yes. Casey Stingle was one of them. Um, there were four or five guys on that team. I, I could pull it up. You, you keep talking. I'm, I'm going to pull it up and I, pull I, can, it up. Uh, I can give you history on all of them. And, and the interesting thing is that's why that's the luxury of sitting with this topic for so long. Yes. Uh, and I think that surprises people. Uh, because I would go places like I, I, I was going somewhere. I'm trying to think what city it was, uh, and 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 the lady was saying, uh, well, the only baseball player uh, we, we have from here was Fred Clark. And she said, you probably never heard of him. And I guess they figure I'm a black guy. I'm only supposed to know about black players. Right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, Cap Rick Clark, Clark manager of the Pirates at the tournament this century. She said, Hall "Yeah, of, Hall of Fame outfielder. Right. Yeah, he was a fantastic player you, for you, sure." You need to know these things when you're out there talking to people, and uh, so I, I I do good research and um, I try to bring bring my topic and make it come alive for wherever I'm at. But Kansas City had a, a lot of really good players, and I I did uh, talk to some of Tierney's uh, relatives. And if you look at, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, it would be my uh, Wilbur Bullet Rogan and the Kansas City Monarchs book. Uh, I do have a picture in there, Cot Tyranny, uh, that, uh, that came from his family. Another one uh, was Roy Sanders, who used to pitch for Cincinnati. He was in Kansas City, and, and he was kind of like a higher gun. So the Monarchs, like I say, they might go to Osawatomie, Kansas. And, and Osawatomie, this is a real example, Osawatomie hired uh sanders to come down and pitch for them and sanders at that particular time he wasn't more famous than his brother his brother had a big band called the clean sanders man that was that was more popular than roy at that time so <laughs> but roy played under uh, christy matheson uh when he was a manager but yeah this all of this history when you tell these stories you've got to like try to merge all this history together to tell the correct story and i yeah I, you know, I, so often I think, you know, uh, I hear kind of a slanted story. Uh, I will tell you this. I, I like your analogy when you say you went back to the uh, to the Civil War mm -hmm. location and walked on the field, right? Mm -hmm. But just imagine you go back to the Civil War location, but you're trying to recreate the Civil War using World War II thinking. Yes. It's not the same. And, Perspective and is important, yes. Yeah, and I and I think uh, when people are compiling these statistics, I think that they are not thinking the process through correctly. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes. I used to have really deep discussions with John Hallway years ago, and so uh, that those books I have that's called the uh, Phil Dixon American Baseball Chronicles, uh, the Great Teams, the Homestead Grays, and uh, the Philadelphia Giants. I try to show people this is how you ought to do the history. And instead of trying to make it look like major league history, you need to tell the story as the story unfolded in its, right. own, in its own in its own era in its own classification. Instead of trying to make it look like a major league and then leaving out half the data, three fourths of the data, and saying mm -hmm. saying we're introducing people to something new. That's right. Perspective and context are are immensely important, and that's the one thing I've been trying to stress here is. These players, and what nobody, I mean, nobody uh, is trying to mythologize these guys and make them all into major league players. It's like any other sport. You're going to have your superstars. You're going to have your, your good players. You're going to have your average players. You're going to have your poor players. You're going to have your players who are, who are only there because they needed to have a backup catcher. <laughs> on the mm -hmm. roster that day, right? That's that's baseball even today, right? Uh so uh but to me, if you're major league if you're if you're a professional baseball player, 
uh, whether it was 100 years ago or today, you had some skills. And, and everybody knew who the better players were. And so these players were not playing in the, in the Negro Leagues or barnstorming because they weren't good enough. And I think mm-hmm. it's a safe bet that a large percentage of them, and I don't mean large in, in, in most, I'm saying uh, Major League Baseball is made up of, uh, uh, at the time, there was only 16 teams, so you're only talking about three to 300 to 400 players. Mm-hmm. At least 15 to 20% would have been Negro League players who would have now been in major in Major League Baseball, and then that trickle down effect, uh, just a thumb in the air, right? I mean, you know, some percentage would have made it, and then that would have meant that those guys were now trickled down into the minor leagues, and then the same would thing would have happened at every single level. So uh, they weren't not playing there because they weren't capable. They weren't playing there because they were not allowed, <laughs> and that's a big big difference. Uh, you 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 you've got to do what you've got to do, and this is what they had to do. You know, you know, boy, you make you, you make some interesting points there, because um, I hear a lot of times talking about the percentage of black people that might have been in the major leagues. Mm-hmm. Now, what's interesting is if you have watched the NBA, it throws all those percentages out the out the window. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Because, That's mostly. Because, yeah. It, and so you kind of say, okay, so if it happened in the NBA and at the turn of the century, uh, the most popular sport for black people was baseball, what really would have happened? Now, I can tell you this, though. If you read my Dizzy Dean book, and I talk about some of the people who were uh, part of the Dizzy Dean All-Stars, and it gave me a chance to talk about guys who only appeared in the major leagues for one, two three games, four games that are playing on the Dizzy Dean Mm All-Stars. But these ball players, many of them have been playing against black teams in their area. So whether it was Oklahoma or Wichita, Des Moines, Iowa, Mm -hmm. Philadelphia, and those guys weren't better than the Negro League. Mm -hmm. So, but, but it's, you have to like find a way to explain it so it makes sense to people. Yep. I'm media. only, I'm going by, uh, you know, if, if the percentage of the population, I'm only, this is just an estimate. At a minimum, it would have been that many. Uh, who who knows? And that that's the, the, yeah, the sad thing know. about all this. Who knows? I mean, at this point, uh, you, you know, you, you, you the stories need to be told and this context needs to be given to it. And so people understand uh, there's no way to go back, uh, unfortunately. And, and, we are where we are, but this is a piece of history that not only needs to be told, but it had significance not just in um, in in the baseball world. I mean, you go back to 1920 with what was going on. I mean, we were we, we, other than a world war. <laughs> the similarity between 1920 and 2020 uh, are are with the pandemic and and some of the other things that are going on uh, socially. Uh, and so forth are very very similar and it's kind of crazy to me that 100 years later here we are <laughs> again but um the significance of what like i said well, when we talked about rube foster and the negro National League in 1920 um goes beyond just the fact that uh, it was baseball it, it had it had ripple effects on um you know the social and and other aspects of the country as well and that's important. People need to understand that it was a step in the right direction. You know, uh, some some of the things that uh, that how can I put it don't often get written about, but it's mm-hmm. just fascinating. Um, one of them is uh, one of my favorite players, uh, Henry Milton, played uh, for the Kansas City Monarchs. And Henry Milton was faster than Papa Bill. I'm almost sure. And uh, Henry Milton stole a lot of bases. So you hardly hear anybody talking about Henry Milton. Now, now Henry Milton, it's an interesting thing. He went to a mixed high school in East Chicago, Indiana. And Henry Milton didn't run track until he got to the, uh, what we call the HBCU. Mm-hmm. So he, he went down to Texas, right? Played with Wiley University. But he came out of a mixed school. He played on a baseball team, didn't run track. But when he got down there, he ran in the, I think, the 1932 Tuskegee Relays. And um, the Tuskegee, Tuskegee Relays brought in all the greatest black track athletes from around the country, right? 
And he was like one tenth of a second off Eddie Tolan's world record at that time <laughs> in the 100 yard dash. But this guy's playing baseball and mm -hmm. he could flat out fly. I love talking about him and uh, I'm talking about him even more in a, in a new edition I'm putting out on the you know, Buckle Neo uh, 1938 rookie season. But there's so many great stories that are like Countless. still still waiting to be told. Absolutely. I, 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 that's why I give, man, the, the, the credit to all you guys that have been at this for such a long time and, 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 and not just saying, okay, you know, we're not getting anywhere with this. You, you kept, you guys have, you have kept it up and, and kept it going and uh, it's got to keep on going. I mean, that's why I've tried to bring on, I've tried to bring on, you know, not just uh, authors, researchers, but other, other um, people are going to be coming on as well. Artists, card artists um uh i've had on um a young a young man who <clears throat> happened to meet uh dr brunson uh when he was at niu and had some he grew up in the group fosters uh that neighborhood in chicago near it and 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 so he got interested in it but those are the people this next generation that's gonna you know find uh something about this that that touches them and and they they carry it on because like you just said there's more out there i mean every day there's more things that are being uh discovered and found and and it, it's it's a lot of digging but uh, man i give you guys so much credit and for for doing it and and all these stories i mean i think they're just fantastic um so uh let's take a look i'm gonna throw up your books because i I want people to take a look at these as well. And you can maybe just give us a little bit of a synopsis of what we got going here. Um, give me one second. All right, where are we? All right, so you've written seven books, is it? Yeah, you know, uh, a couple of them I reissued as well. So, um, okay, with the reissue, it's it's not. So the first one I got up there is the John Buck O'Neill book, nineteen thirty-eight. When did you write this one? That one came out, I think, originally in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, um, and that one was born. From a 1985 interview I did with Buck O'Neill, wow. and uh, we we had planned to talk about 38, and then we were going to go to 39, 40, 41, and it was like a real detailed. Oh interview. wow! So so uh, four hours later, after talking to, him, we were so exhausted that we never got to 39, and uh, he's ready to leave for spring training. Uh, and so we didn't get to 39, but we did do 38. And I learned a lot of things about 38. And then after Buck died, you know, most of uh, what people talk about Buck is almost Buck in the modern time. Mm -hmm. uh, well, they didn't sit in the detail that, that I had with him. I mean, we're looking at the schedule. We're talking about where you went, where you stayed, uh, who's on the team, where they came from. Mm -hmm. What were their tendencies? How did how did he get on the team? Was he married? When did he die? You know, I mean, we're going into detail, especially about where you stayed and those kind of things. And uh, so this book came out of that. And and I might also mention that one thing that I have done with all of my books is I try to write books that I would have wanted to read when I was just first learning about this topic. So mm -hmm. that's, that's part right. of my my thought pattern whenever I'm writing a book, is this something that would have helped me when I first started? And so I try to write books like that. And yeah. So this is Buck O'Neill's voice. Now this one, uh, when I released that, since that time, I found about 30 more games. And it goes from city to city. It's, it's, it's almost a, another true barnstorming book, I'm right? Gonna, I'm going to have to see if I can but, pick this thing up. I've got 30, yeah. 30 more games and a new twist that I have on this book. And so we're working on this uh, upcoming version. It's mm -hmm. going to have a slightly different title. It's going to have more games in there. Cool. And, more, uh, and it's going to be pretty exciting. So 
this sounds pretty come, fascinating. Uh, probably with the next five months. All right. So here's the next one we got is um, about Wilbur Bullet Rogan and the Kansas City Monarchs. Oh, man. I haven't talked about Wilbur, Wilbur Bullet Rogan. Oh, let me mention one more thing on Buck O'Neill. Mm -hmm. uh, 1985, I did a documentary with Buck O'Neill. It was an hour-long uh, interview with Buck O'Neill and a documentary. Mm -hmm. And most people have never seen it. Now, this predated Ken Burns. Wow. You know, by a number of years. Wow. But once again, I was one of the early people out to shoot, so I was doing some pretty creative things. What are you going to okay. do with it? Uh, Wilbur, Wilbur what, Bullet Rogan. Uh, so go ahead. What are you going to do with that Buck O'Neill interview? Uh, it, something may be coming. All right, cool. But, All right. Good, good. It aired on TV in 1985. Just imagine that. Locally in Kansas City. Wow. But most people have not ever seen it. All right, man. Good. I hope you get it out there. Awesome. All right. So Wilbur, so Bullet Rogan and the Monarchs. Wilbur Bullet Rogan, one of my favorite players. Mm -hmm. Wilbur Bullet Rogan grew up in my hometown, Kansas City, Kansas. And mm -hmm. um, uh, there were people who actually knew Rogan who would tell me stories, and I just started writing them down. And, uh, of course, I, I knew Rogan's son very well. As a matter of fact, if you listen to his induction speech in Cooperstown when he's talking about his father, you know, he mentions my name. I actually got um, my name mentioned awesome. in a Hall of Fame awesome. induction speech. Hey, I'll take that. Very but cool. um, yeah, so he was from. He grew up in Kansas City, Kansas. He played at a park called Riverside Park, which is on Second and Franklin. Uh, he lived uh, probably uh, about half a block from the church, right? I tend to this day, first day in me that was built in 1905. Who knows? He might have actually gone to church there and visited. So, but Wilbur Bullet Rogan, I think, is uh, all, the greatest all around baseball player that ever lived. And I wanted to write the story and make this argument because when people think about all around baseball players, first person they think about is Babe Ruth, right? Mm -hmm. And when I say all around, that's someone who can pitch and. Yes play yes. other positions, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I know that Bullet Rogan was superior to Babe Ruth as a pitcher. And Babe Ruth only pitched a few years. Rogan pitched many years. He was all, Rogan was also hit for average. Mm -hmm. Babe Ruth didn't necessarily hit for average, but he hit for power. But hey, Bullet Rogan at five foot seven and a half hit over 500 home runs. Don't believe what you read about his statistics. Read the book. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, um, and how about this? Bullet Rogan was a 10 second man, which means he could run the 100 yard dash in under 10 seconds. Now, you know, Babe Ruth couldn't do that. No, it's, it's interesting you brought that up because someone asked the question um, the other day about uh, John Donaldson and, you know, uh, who, who's, a, who's a modern player who would be like that? There are none. I mean, in, in today's specialization, uh, certainly of pitchers, uh, they don't play the field anymore. So you've got uh, Shohei Otani of the uh, of the Angels, who is is bringing that back. He's like a he's almost like a Negro League player. He's he's a, a hitter, a, a heck of a hitter, and a, a pretty darn good pitcher as well. And uh, you know when Bullet Rogan wasn't uh, pitching and batting cleanup. He was probably playing center field in batting cleanup because John Donaldson was pitching and batting third, and so forth. I mean, these guys, these guys were not just good um, uh, at whatever position they played, whether that be pitcher, center, first. They could also do a lot, number of other things as well. You know, by the time John Donaldson comes to the Monarchs in 1920, and John Donaldson had actually thrown his arm out, yep. and because and part of the thing was J.L. Wilkinson and their strategy was to pitch this guy because uh, every place they went, they had advertised him so much. That's who people wanted to see. Mm -hmm. So he was literally pitching all night. Now, mm -hmm. they got a little smarter later on uh, when they uh, got Satchel Page, but Satchel Page only come out and pitch three in. But here's another thing. They... Satchel Page, prior him to him coming to the Monarchs, uh, J.L. Wilkinson and Tom Baird, they were all involved with a guy named Ray L. Doan out of Muscatine, Iowa, who in 1931 
had Grover Cleveland Alexander who would come and pitch one inning a night. And he would pitch almost every night. So they learned a lot, not just from black players, they learned from white players, Robert Cleveland mm-hmm. Alexander. But it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's one history. It's not a separate history. It's really one history. And so most people don't know that in 1930, of course, the Kansas City Monarchs introduced night baseball. Yes. And they, t- Long they took it. Years the- ahead of uh, major leagues, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they took it. They took it as many places as they could. But there were a lot of places that they did not go. So the next year, the Kansas City Monarchs leased their lights to Ray L. Doan and the House of David. And the House of David completed the job that the Monarchs started with the same lights, the Kansas City lights. So, so and in all actuality, uh, the first major league, uh, I'm not the first time night baseball was played in a major league park, it was with the Kansas City Monarchs lights. Mm-hmm. And that was at a Pittsburgh Sports Field. But awesome. the next year, awesome. there's several major league parks, uh, including Cincinnati, who we know in 1935 played the night game. They're playing with the Kansas City Monarchs lights in Grover Cleveland Alexander is pitching. So mm-hmm. there's a great history there. Mm-hmm. And uh, these are histories that aren't being shared in the correct perspective. Right. Perspective and, and context are important. All right. Yeah. So the Dizzy Daffy Dean Barnstorming Tour. Wow. Well, there's so much I can say about that book. If, if you know anything about Dizzy Dean, you already know he mm-hmm. was colorful. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you put Dizzy Dean and his colorful self with the Negro Leagues. And, and of course, he meets Satchel Page on that tour. And, uh, that had and, to be a heck uh, of a show. <laughs> hey, hey, you got a good book when you put all of that together correctly. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I wanted the people to, uh, to learn from that book. So that book was like the perfect storm because all the things I had wanted to talk about, you know, uh, based on players' abilities and comparison, because Dizzy Dean is in there every night pitching against the media leaguers. He's at the top of his game, and Paul was as well. Mm-hmm. So he gave me that. And then, of course, uh, Ducky met with, joined them uh, for mm-hmm. – actually, he joined them for one game. He got struck out four times in a row. And, Hall of and Fame. He didn't come back. Hall of Famer. He didn't show up the next night. Hall of Famer, Ducky Medwick. Now, a Hall of Famer mm-hmm. got struck out by Ed Stone, who people, unless you're a serious follower of the Negro Baseball League, you don't know who he is. No, you wouldn't so, even know. <laughs> no, you, would, you wouldn't know. And guess what? Even then, it was hard to find that history because certain newspapers, they refused to write what was going on. Sure. I don't doubt it. You had to dig all the newspapers out and compare the information and how it was portrayed. So it's it's a book that will educate you as well as entertain. You know what? I can tell you, uh, I I, I know exactly where you're coming from. Like I said, I try to do a little bit of uh, amateur historian uh, in my own fashion right and so I'll go on to like I said newspapers.com and and on other websites like that uh, the Pittsburgh Courier you can find uh, online and dig some of these stories and when you read the actual accounts uh, that is what people were writing at the time and you can tell by where it was written what the uh, message was that they were trying to say. And and so it, it, it's kind of not really much different today with the amount of uh, uh, perspectives that are out there. Everybody's got an opinion, right? So when you read some of these newspaper accounts, they are eye-opening when you read about some of these uh, uh, games that were going on and then the, the, uh, the different context to it so I, I i encourage people to do it i mean i know it's it's not easy to do for everybody but that's why people like you putting these books together makes it it's people I, well, people need it. to go out and read them because it's it's fascinating yeah. so we got well, andrew again, I, try, I try to write books that i would have wanted to read so that's right so now we got the, your rube foster book up here the harvest on freedom's fields yeah you you know i i walked around with that book for 20 years trying to figure out a name for it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I went to hear Angela Davis, and uh, she was speaking at a university, and I sit there listening to her, and she talked about freedom in such a way, and I said, that's it right there. And I came back home that night, 
and I named the book A Harvest on Freedom Fields. Rube and, Foster. Uh, Rube Foster. If anybody, people don't understand the significance of Rube Foster. And, and I mean, he could have, he had a playing career as a pitcher that was mm -hmm. exemplary. He could have been a Hall of Fame player. Uh, he went into the baseball, uh, National Baseball Hall of Fame as uh, an owner, an executive, mm -hmm. but he he did so many other things. He was a, a promoter and an organizer and a writer, and uh, he was, you know, a, a, a evaluator of talent. I mean, he could do everything. Uh, and I guess if you can, if you're going to come up with, I guess, a godfather of of black baseball and, and Negro League baseball leagues, it's got to be Rube Foster, right? Well, when it comes to the league, definitely. But if you if you really want to talk about someone where a lot of people were influenced by his knowledge, it would have to be Saul White. Oh, Rube yes, Foster played, played under Saul White as well for a couple of years. And um, he used some of his strategies. One of the strategies Rube used that Saul White Saul Wake uh, used a three-man pitching staff. And these guys went over 100 games a year. So he always used two righties and a left. So he had the three-man pitching staff. And Rube, actually, uh, in 1905, he was one of the three men. It was him and Emmett Bowman. And uh, well, I'm going to I'm I'm uh, blank on his name. He's a left-hander on that team. I'll call him a man. Mm -hmm. But when Rube got to Chicago, and by 1910, he develops this uh, really great team. He's got Pat Doherty, the left-hander, and then, of course, Frank Whitware and himself. But this is, that was something that Saul White had done. So, mm -hmm. once again, by sitting with this topic so long, you begin to understand and you follow the teams and you start to see patterns no. of, of what, how they're formulating these strategies and understanding. But, you no, know, Ruth Foster, hey, he, guess what? They haven't put him in the Hall of Fame as a player, but believe me, that was a, that was an oversight. This mm -hmm. guy was a sensational. He might have been the greatest pitcher in the world at the turn of the century of mm -hmm. around 1905, 1906. He, he dominated that's everybody he faced. That's right. Christian Jackson is at his prime. Mm -hmm. right. And that's an interesting thing you just brought up, right? I mean, uh, everything became an equation, right? You, became, you know, Pop Lloyd became the uh, the black um, Honus Wagner, and and uh, you know, uh, they all had their own. They had their equations to. Uh, um, to the uh, pitchers of the day who were in the major leagues. So Rube Foster, at the time, the, the top pitcher in Major League Baseball in the early part of, you know, 1900s, was Rube Waddell. Isn't that where he got his nickname? Yeah, he beat Rube Waddell in Atlanta City. Mm -hmm. So people just started calling him Rube. Rube, yeah. But, but at the same time, you know, uh, some of these nicknames that players had, if you were – a guy coming up from a small town, you didn't quite, you know, know how to maneuver in the big yeah. city. Uh, that was another way that you could get the Rube name as well. So, yeah, you were you uh, were uh, uh, an easy mark, a Rube. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, 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 so these nicknames, you know, you know, the whole thing, the whole legacy of nicknames. Uh, sometimes when I go out to speak, I try to tell people nicknames are culture, you know, because. If you look in black baseball, there's no Dutch, no Nick player nicknamed Dutch no. or Swede. No. You know, because it's cultural. But you go to the. So, but you know, if, if you try to lump everything together, like this is just uh, one happy America, mm -hmm. and you, you miss, you missed it because. Uh, and, and I might also mention making the ball players a pocket book version of a white player uh, there are some authors who do that mm -hmm. even in modern day but if you ever read one of my books you'll see that it's never in my book i have no, never I, done that in it's anybody. not fair it's not a fair yeah. thing to do to, to, to equate them that way i i've never agreed with that either i just didn't think it was it didn't make any sense it, to me. Was, but it was something that came out of the past mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to go into the future mm -hmm. no uh, so anybody who's out there from Kansas City, you did one here on KC Baseball, which I'm sure if you're a uh, native of Kansas City, has got to have some pretty fascinating 
trivia questions in there. Yeah. Well, the reason I did that book, it was called, the, it was my first book called the Kansas City Baseball Trivia Quiz Book. And what I wanted to do was to make baseball history in Kansas City all one history. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want, you know, the Negro League over here and then the, then you yep. got the major league over there and then and then you got the minor league over here because you know Kansas City wasn't a major league town at that time, even though back in eighteen eighty four we had the Kansas City Cowboys in the National League. Mm -hmm. One of the questions in the book. But so I wanted to merge all the histories together. So that's kind of the unique thing that that's different on that book. It was it made all of baseball in Kansas City one history and and so uh, one other thing I might mention about that book was uh, not only did I uh, do the history of those leagues, but I also uh, talked about the Van Johnson League, which had a lot of guys who went up to the major leagues. Well, I had you... a chance to, uh, uh, Van Johnson played play close to one of the houses where I lived growing up, so I could go down and uh, and watch. Matter of fact, uh, I drove my son by there for years, and I said, see this house right here? I saw it guy in the park still there right i said see the grand stair i saw a guy hit the ball on top of this house he said that's too far i said no nah. his name was skip james he went to the san francisco giants he used to play in the band johnson league and his collegiate league and bobby allison came out of that league oh some great players mm -hmm. came out of the kansas city band johnson league so i wanted to put all that in one history mm -hmm. and tell you so uh, it was cool. my first book and uh I'm still proud of it. Cool. And and to people who don't know who Ben Johnson was, I mean, he was the uh, father of the American League. Uh, and, and at the turn of the century, Ben Johnson, um, uh, there was uh, the the war between the American and National League. And, and eventually right. in 1903, they figured it out. And we've had pretty much the same uh, American League, National League meeting in a World Series ever since with, with some, you know, little bit of, uh, I think John McGraw didn't play in it one year, but <laughs> Ben Johnson uh, brought, uh, and so Kansas City was in that league in the 1890s, uh, that, that Ben Johnson was, was uh, running, was No, that, not that particular. Now, what's interesting, if I'm, my memory serves me correct, they had a, a kind of a trial kind of American League that Kansas City was in, but it, it didn't turn out to be the American League that we know today, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was either 1900 or 1901. Was, uh, I think the American League, right before the American League became the American League that it is today. Yep. But now Kansas City was in the National League with the Kansas City Cowboys. And so we, we were actually originally a, uh, a National League town and also we were in the Federal League with the Kansas City Packers as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, a lot of deep baseball history in Kansas City for sure. So these it's two, all in that book. Uh, it's well, all, pick know. it up and answer some trivia questions. I'm sure I'm sure some fascinating uh, uh, questions in there if you're a Kansas City uh, native and a baseball fan for sure. So I have both of these books. I have uh, your volume one and three. Um, and so tell us about why there's not a two. You, you started telling me a little bit the other night when we were talking, but yeah. two, and I'm, I'm almost finished with it now. Two was the 1910 Leland Giants. Okay. And it was, well, it was very difficult to put together. And I couldn't quite put it together the way I had done the, the, the uh, Philadelphia Giants and the Homestead Grays. Data was real spiky. So I, trying to tell the story was, was real cumbersome. So I put it back on the shelf and I said, well, you know, uh, I'll get it done one of these days. And so I just, I pulled it out about two months ago and I had information and I could see the date that I had uh, done the research was 2006. So I'm almost finished with it because I, the light, the light turned on and all the ideas that I couldn't think of in 2006 came to me in 2020, 2021. <laughs> That happens. So, yeah. So that it's gonna it's gonna come out this year, awesome. and, uh, and and it, and that book gives me a chance to talk about who I think is the greatest baseball player of that particular period, or just a, a pure baseball player, and it's Pete Hill. Pete mm. Hill was a fantastic, fantastic baseball player, and and believe me, no one I can tell you, no one knows the story of Pete Hill. 
Preston. It, does. it has Preston not been written. Yeah. He was good. He was good. Um, yeah. So here's Come your. <clears throat> so looking forward to that. That'd be fun to get that out there. And so, what was your thought press? How many volumes were you going to do? Well, actually, uh, <laughs> I've As, got about three more volumes started. So cool. And, and I think now because. Uh, I don't like the way that they are approaching statistics today, right? Because I'm with I feel you. like it doesn't tell the whole story. Mm -hmm. Whereas in those books, I get a chance to tell you all of the story, not just you know. I don't just give you statistics. I give you, I give you a narrative. I give you stats, but I give you what's really there, and I explain what's not there. I explain why it's not there, and so yes. uh, it's just a whole different approach. And this came out of my discussion with John Hallway over a 15, 20 year period. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on today's uh, uh, baseball statistics uh, have, have gotten a little out of whack here uh, with what we're measuring with the launch angle and <laughs> spin rate. Important stuff, don't get me wrong, but when I watch a baseball game, if someone pops out to shortstop, I really don't care what the launch angle was. <laughs> I really don't. And and, and so the, it just seems like we're getting into these weeds here and it's become such a focus. And, and you're, you're absolutely right. Statistics, uh, and then forget about it with the Negro Leagues when you try to dig into these, because uh, they're, mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to say spotty, but they're, they're, they're incomplete right now. And, and it's hard to get a gauge on these things. And, 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 and that's, let, let me go back on something and give, give me your thoughts on this, because I don't want to. I don't want to take up too much of your time here, but I do want to ask you this. One of the things about back in the 1920s when Rube Foster started the, I'm going to put you back on now. I just, I threw up your website here just so we can plug that for you as well. The, your uh, nlbalive.com if anybody wants to check out any more of Phil's work and, and a little bit more about him. But um, let me put you back on here. All right. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about that I, I think, um, you know, people need to understand, and I've tried to stress this, and, and is you know, we're talking 1920. You had a dynamic going on here of um, obviously the segregated leagues, but then the Negro League teams were having to play. Um, they didn't have their own stadiums. So they're at the whim of a lot of different wins here, right? You had booking agents, you had stadium owners, you had their own players, you had the opposing players, everybody wanting a piece of the pie. And, and, and the dynamic that that creates, uh, because it, it plays into all this, the need to play. Uh, it didn't, it didn't, you know, everybody wanted to put it into this nice 154 or 140 game schedule uh, and, and, and see it like a major league. And it needed to get there. Don't get me wrong, but they couldn't at this time. Correct. I mean, this was something that just was out of their hands. Was this something that Rube Foster, did these guys want, they wanted to get to that level at some point or, or what, what was up with that? Well, I know, first of all, they had to make a living. And so barnstorming games, I mean, you know, they play a five-game series, right? So on that fifth day, maybe they're playing on a Tuesday afternoon. Well, the Tuesday afternoon game, right, uh, is not going to draw like the weekend game. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you might leave, say, for instance, the Monarchs, they might leave their uh, Kansas City in the next day, say, maybe they're playing in Columbia, Missouri. And Columbia, Missouri will pay them approximately what they would have made maybe on Friday or Saturday. Mm -hmm. So that Tuesday game wasn't profitable. So the next day, next year in 21, they cut it down to a four game series. But see, they had to figure this out. And then, of course, they're traveling by train. So uh, there's, yep. there's some complications in there because you can only go where the train is, right? And uh, so. Yeah, it, it was about economics yes. as much as it was anything else. So if they could have played a five-game series and made money every day, then you probably would have saw more league games, but it just wasn't sold. So they had to make sure that they survived, and that's where these barnstorming teams came in. And the town baseball was at a pinnacle, and guess what? They bring a black team to town to play the town team. 
man, they're going to pack the house. The mm-hmm. major league team is going to make money. The local town team is going to make money. How do you ignore that? And they couldn't. No. They couldn't. So they would never get to a 150-game schedule. If you got to a 70-game schedule and then you had to play another 50 games, barnstorming games, that's what you did to survive. And the teams that didn't do that very well, they didn't survive. That's right. So, so <clears throat> another layer of the context, right? Because not only the whole segregation issue and Jim Crow and not being able to play in these towns and not being able to play in Major League Baseball or organized baseball with white players, period, you know, for that matter. Uh, and now this need to have to, you know, uh, play to get paid. That was that was what you had to do. It was no different than any job today. So, so those dynamics you can you have to understand them otherwise you're, you're going to want to take statistics and say oh well they just played against the american legion team there and then you can't count those statistics well maybe not <laughs> but they weren't playing those te- games because they uh, were not good enough to play somewhere else and, and i just want i just hope people understand that that is really the whole driving thing here they 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 were doing what they were doing playing where they were playing because they had to at the time. <clears throat> uh, it was out of their hands. I mean, as I'm sure, if way back in 1870-something when uh, the, the Walker boys were gonna <laughs> were playing for Toledo or whatever teams they were playing in and everything started as normal, we wouldn't even, you know, these discussions wouldn't even be going on. I mean, you wouldn't have these arguments because these guys would have been playing and, and, and everything would be right with the world. We're not there, right. and these stories just need to be told. I, I, I just, I mean, these, these are these fascinating. I, I could talk to you. I'm telling you, till the sun comes up. <laughs> it, it would be. Uh, it, it, it's we'll all. Do it again. I would love we'll to have, have you on here again. This, this was great. Do you, uh, you have anything else you wanna, you wanna add be, before we uh, 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 sign off here? Well, I, I encourage people to go out to my website. You know. Yep. Uh, people ask me, they say, how can I get your books, right? And uh, if you order from my website, I can sign it for you and send it to you. Of course, you go to Amazon or something like that. You can get the book, but uh, I can sign it to you basically the same price. And, it's and so you check it on my website. That's the way to do it. NLBalive.com. And, uh, and, and that uh, my, my face is in the way, so I'm going to try to put up the uh, – I'm going to try to put up the actual website on the web here, but let's see if that, and that'll show the, uh, uh, yeah, so there you go. There's a, there's a, an added feature. If you go to, uh, you go to your, uh, go through you, you'll get your, you'll get your uh, autograph on the book. That would be nice, right? right? Hey, hey. <laughs> Father's Day is coming up. Hey, I can personalize it today and a mom, who, you know, for, for, for little Johnny as well. But That's the thing right. is, uh, I'm there always introducing something new. Now, I want to do more blogs, but it seems like I'm so yeah, busy with the book. Only, I can't get to the blog. Only so <laughs> much time in the day, right, man? I mean, that's the exactly yeah. Right. Exactly so yeah, right. so there we go. So it's in NLBA, NLBalive.com. Uh, you've got your, a uh, little bit about you. You've got your events coming up. You've got, uh, I suggest people follow you on Twitter. You put out uh, a lot of uh, pretty cool stuff uh, as far as little tidbits of information like many people try to do. And just keep keep uh, uh, informing people. That's really what it's, what it's all about. I mean, and I, I really, I, I give you, uh, you all the credit. I mean, your, your trip, that, that thing, when I read that many years ago about you making that trip around the country, it just blew me away that that was... You're a modern barnstormer. There's no, no doubt about it. I, I don't know if anybody's done what you have. I, I, I don't think so. I mean. Well, you know, you know. sometimes I think about some of the things I've been fortunate to do. Like uh, I wrote the inscription on the back of Satchel Page. It's monument. I was the first person to uh, teach a college class specifically to the Negro Leagues. Uh, mm-hmm. I was the first person to put out a, uh, an actual first black person to put out a a baseball card set on the Negro Leagues using actual photographs. When was that? Uh, 1987. It was called Dixon's Negro League Grades. No and, kidding. Uh, That's, is that floating around out there somewhere? Actually, you can get it from my website. 
Oh, you, you still you have it? Out. No kidding. I still have stuff. You I'll know, have I have to check that out. I did the card set, and then I got a contract to do the uh, photographic history. So I put the cards up, and they were up for about 20 years in the basement. <laughs> and then one day I was looking, I said, hey, man, these things are going for $40, $50 a set. I mm -hmm. said, I got a few in the basement. So now, you know, I only sell them through my website or when I go somewhere in, cool. in person that you can't do much of right now. Oh, it's but, cool. Uh, back out again but yeah yeah you can definitely get them there so you know these are some of the things and of course being a co-founder of the Negro Leaf Museum you know I've been blessed and I you know I just feel like um, I've been blessed in the past but I feel like the best is yet to come mm -hmm. uh, so lots more work tomorrow. out there uh, it's 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 endless really I mean I, there's so much out there that I think needs to be told and and you're a good teller of it I can tell you that <laughs> All well, right, man. I, you want to? You want to see? I'm going to show you. You got another few more minutes. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I was going to throw up. Uh, what I normally do after I get done is uh, I'm going to throw up now what what the whole premise behind this was. Um, so, out of the park uh, is a simulation game, and it, it's a it's a video game, but it's different in the aspect that it's more built along uh, management, um, front office, um, you, your field manager, there's not, you're not using a, a, a game controller or anything like that to control the player pitching and hitting like you would with like a, a video game like modern MLB The Show. So, so what I did is I, I set up a 1920 season uh, as a what if and this game allows you to set up basically any season anytime anywhere uh, and run it any way you want so I've set up the 1920 season uh, we are on June the 7th on the date so usually I do a week of this um, every time I do one of these so the St. Louis Giants are on top tied with Detroit in the Negro National League and so I've taken some liberties here because we know, as you pointed out earlier, uh, there were only the eight Negro National League teams that we see here. St. Louis Giants, Detroit Stars, Chicago American Giants, Dayton Marcos, Kansas City Monarchs, Indianapolis ABC, Chicago Giants, Cuban Stars West. And so there were teams in the East, though, that had a loose affiliation and they would play occasionally and were playing each other. And the Eastern Colored League doesn't come along until 1923, but I've set them up here because I wanted to get players into this simulation that I felt needed to be there. So when you look at, um, for example, the um, Bacharax, you know, okay. I, I did not want to miss Cannonball Redding <laughs> in this. I did not want to miss uh, Dick Lundy and Oliver Marcel. Uh, and some of, so some of these teams, I wanted to make sure we're in there. And so I, a little poetic license here. So what I'm doing is I'm playing a 140 game season. Uh, and then the winners will play in a, um, in a world series. And so I'm at June the 7th. So the game allows you to set up all these rosters. So we'll take a look at the Kansas city Monarchs. So, um, their pitching staff, Sam Crawford, Jose Mendez, who was 35 and, and you know, uh, probably a little past his prime, but uh, played a little bit in the field. He was also their manager, correct, in 1920. <laughs> so he did it all. Uh, there's John Donaldson, Bullet Rogan. And then their lineup on the field is uh, Portuando at third, Donaldson in center, Rogan, and so forth. Hurley McNair, Tank Carr. So you have all of these players. And what I tried to do is go in make sure that all because there's a statistical database it's it's there that comes with the game many of these guys did not have their uh and and that's true even of the major leagues and minor leagues that come with it uh the real team the the uh, major league teams the, the incomplete information so i tried to go in here and find the right picture uh city of birth their uh you know, it has so much in here that you can add. And you get to see when you look at these, like, for example, Donaldson, what his real life stats were, uh, known stats. So, you know, again, we, as you talked about, he was pitching long before this and he was on all nations and, and uh, 
pitching barnstorming all around the country. But here's his 1920 season where he had uh, uh, 306 batting average, eight home runs. That's what people want to see. You know, like, like you talked about the statistics. Um, you know, people want to put it into that uh, modern context. So it's kind of what I'm trying to do here and to take it to another audience, to take it to, uh, you know, people who are uh, casual, you know, knowledge of the of the Negro Leagues, maybe don't know anything about it at all, but get it to it in front of a different group of people. Uh, these are simulations, these are gamers, a different crowd. Um, and, and I, and so far, you know, people have really, uh, you know, they've, they've enjoyed it. So, uh, this is what I've got here. And so you can literally play, I'm not going to do it tonight, but you can literally play pitch by pitch if you wanted to on the field and watch the game as if you were watching a regular game, uh, or you can play a game in, in just a few seconds. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to play, uh, the day and you'll see that it, it up updated all of the uh, the standings <clears throat> so Detroit won their seventh straight and moved ahead if you wanted to take a look at what that game was on the schedule they beat the Dayton four to three the box score um, everything everything like a uh, it, it blows you away that the the the, uh, the detail and complexity in this game so Detroit um, Joe Hewitt at third Bill Riggins at short. There's your Pete Hill, your man Pete Hill in center mm -hmm. field. Uh, Jimmy Lyons in left, Edgar Wesley. So you see it, Bill Gatewood in right, normally pitches. Buddy Petway catching. Who pitched? Billy Holland pitched. Won his mm -hmm. fifth game. So it's just to have a little fun with this. And then in between, talk to people like you. <laughs> and and uh, um, and get your insights and your perspectives and, and get your stories and these stories in front of people. So <clears throat> I'm going to run through. I even have a draft in here. I'll just show you that real quick. There's even <clears throat> the upcoming draft in the Negro Leagues. Um, has got an interesting draft class. There's Cool Papa Bell. He's uh, just turned 20. He was 19. So May 17th was his Papa Bell. Uh, cool Papa Bell's birthday. So he's in the draft class. Turkey Stearns, Mule Suttles, Tubby Scales, Newt Allen, some nice players in this draft class. Uh, and so I'm going to, I'm going to take us to the draft and, and next, next simulation I do uh, next week, I'm going to have the draft. And I'm, and so the draft order right now, Chicago Giants have the first pick. So if you were, if you were drafting for the Chicago Giants, who would you take in this draft class? What year? This is 1920, and you've got, uh, if you're looking at the screen, you've got Cool Papa Bell, Turkey Stearns, Mule Suttles, Newt Allen, uh, Tubby Scales. They're probably your top five players. Pitching-wise, uh, Big George Mitchell, Hooks Beverly, uh, Joe Strong is in there. Some solid pitchers, not superstars. So your superstar players in this draft class are your uh, are your hitters? Who would you take out of those guys if you were drafting for the Chicago Giants? If I was drafting for the Chicago Giants. I would probably take one that they really took. Who's that? Uh, Frank Duncan, catch. Let uh, him go. Well, let's see if Frank Duncan. He might already be on the team. Let's take a look. How many Duncans? How many Duncans were there? There were at least two or three Frank Duncans running around uh, <laughs> the Negro <laughs> Leagues, were there? There were two, and but actually there were three if you count his son. So he's already so there's Frank Duncan, and then there's Frank Duncan Jr. Frank Duncan Jr. would have came in there. So he's he 19 four. years. He's already on the team, 19 years old. Let's take a look at his real stats. He so yeah, he was. 19, so 1920, he was a rookie. So he, it already put him onto this. So, so the class that's coming now would be actually guys who came in in 21 uh, that are being drafted now. So the available. So you got Scales, cool. Scales was a good ball player. Well, actually, all of those guys were so good. Uh, you know, if if I looked at longevity of career, boy, Scales was one that you definitely would want to have around. Yeah, he, he was a. Uh, was was a another one. Who had longevity of career, man. Those guys. Yeah, look at that, George. 
You're right. Look at look at Tubby Scales. All the way to 1946, he plays. <laughs> oh man. And then he then he managed in uh, Puerto Rico, and he owed several titles down there as a manager. I guarantee you, there are not a lot of people on the planet who know who George Tubby Scales even was. But he was a, he was a heck of a ball player. 332 career batting average in the Negro Leagues. Um, yeah, he was a he was a a pretty good offensive player for sure. Yeah, if, you, if you read my uh, 1931 home state race book, you can get a really good kind of only, picture of who Only because he's my favorite player of all time. But I, I, it would be cool, Papa Bell, for me. But I would think yeah, Turkey yeah. Stearns would have to be um, another guy who would be. High on the list of who you're yeah. going to take. I, I tell you what, Coop Papa told me, he told me, and I wrote this in my photographic history. He said, if Turkey Stearns isn't in the Hall of Fame, I don't know what I'm doing. With. <laughs> there you go. You know, see that, what you just said kind of blows me away. Cool Papa Bell told me <laughs> how many people. I, I don't know if there's very, very many people who can can say that sentence that you just said. And that and that's what makes this really, really cool. Is that especially, yeah especially for guys especially for guys that old. Matter of fact, uh I'm gonna say uh on the Kansas City Mo I see, you, you might have with the American Giants that you're Dink Mothel. Yep, he is Dink here. I, I love Dink Mothel. Uh, the thing I loved about him, he's one of my the type of players that I love. He played every position on the field. Mm -hmm. he, yes, you're he right. Went, he went to the American Giant as a catcher. Now, you know, Dink Mothel is the one who got me really into the Negro League. No kidding. Yeah. And so I actually talked to Dink Mothel. Uh, he was living in Topeka at the time, and I stayed in Topeka for six there months. There he is, Topeka, Kansas, born in uh, 1897. And guess he born on August 13th. Do they have that? You got it. I made sure. I tried to make sure. I tried. You, how about that? I tried to make sure I got as much of this in here accurately as I could. So, yes, August 13th, 1897 in Topeka, Kansas. Yes. You ready for this? He was the one who got me started. Guess what the date of my birthday is? Is it August 13th? It's August 13th. How guess, about that? guess the date of my wife's birthday. We're going on 38 years of marriage. Awesome. That's a, see, that's a, that August, was an omen. August 13th. That was an omen. And he was, this was a guy who um, played many years. I'm looking at his numbers here I, on Kansas, on the Monarchs as well. Most of his career, actually. But you're right. Started with Chicago American Giants in 1920. Um, he was there for a little, for a little bit. And uh, uh, he, he went to the American Giants because they offered him more money than the Monarchs did. How about that? And, uh, he was working for a Santa Fe Railroad. And so he's trying to get more than what he's making at Santa Fe Railroad because when, when the baseball season's over, he doesn't have a job, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Ruth Foster offered him, I think, maybe 5 or $10 more than he was getting from the Monarchs who was trying to lure him as well. And uh, he came back after that year. And, you know, he didn't come back to the – that was 1920. He laid out a couple of years, went back to the railroad. In 1922, he went to the uh, All Nations, J.L. Wilkinson's second team. And then he came up to the Monarch. So awesome. He awesome. actually, uh, uh, you know, he, he had an interesting start to his career. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have mentioned him a few times in some of these past broadcasts. I, I love uh, Dink Mothel. I think it was just a fun player, and, and the fact he played so many positions, you could play him anywhere on the field. Let me just show you real quick what this is telling you. So you you, you had some uh, – you did some work with the Kansas City Royals, right? What were we That's doing right. with them? So, so this – assist... Okay, go ahead. No, go ahead. What were you doing with Kansas City? I was the assistant, assistant director of public relations. Awesome. And very, people very cool. Always ask, people always ask me, were you there when Rush Limbaugh was there? No, Rush had <laughs> left a few years before I got there. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, so uh, what this is is a 2080 scouting scale, which uh, you, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but you can set this game up to, to rate them um, uh, on a 1 to 10, 1 to 8, 2080, uh, one to a hundred, whatever. So this is a whatever scale you want to use. This is a 2080 scale. So this is telling you what they currently are and what they um, what they potentially could be. 
And so when I pull up a guy like, um, let's take a look at Bullet Rogan. So pitchers are rated on their overall stuff, which is their, their ability to um, strike people out, movement on the ball, which is uh, the ability to keep the ball in the park, give, give up less home runs. Their control, their pitches are rated individually um, as batters. You can see over here their position rating. So Bullet Rogan has pitcher, catcher, first, second, left, center, and right. And then his batting ratings uh, on a 2080 scale. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's just like regular baseball in the sense that these players have abilities today. And then you can play the game based strictly on that. Or you can let the game age and develop them, and they can become better than they were, the potential, and uh, just like a regular player. What's even crazier about this, Phil, is that the game even has things like this, team chemistry. So it's saying that the, the Kansas City Monarchs lack a captain. <laughs> they have John Donaldson. Uh, and these guys have personalities. Um, you know, plays every game like his his last, John Donaldson. And so, uh, you know, who would have been the captain on the Monarchs in 1920? Probably would have been Jose Mendez, because a lot of times the manager was also the captain. So uh, he was the manager, yes. Okay, so I, I can I can I can adjust Jose Mendez here and uh, make sure that he has a he's a fan favorite right now, <laughs> which no you know, doubt he you know, probably was, right? You know, it's interesting. The Monarchs have a Cuban manager in 1920, but the major leagues don't get a Cuban manager until 1938. Mm -hmm. Interesting. With the Cardinal. So they, they, you know, talk about things that the Negro League made happen. You know, I might also mention you, uh, two of my uh, interest, two interesting players on the Monarchs, you didn't mention their names. Uh, one of them was Edgar Blue, Washington. Edgar Blue Washington. Blue Washington, yeah. Washington. Yeah, he's. Uh, let me see. Let me let me go back. I'll put that up. He is on the team. Yes. Uh, yeah. Hang on. Let me okay. let me go. Uh, put that back up there and pull up the Monarchs. So here's the rest of their roster. Um, yep, they've got uh, Tank Car. So on their bench they have Edgar Washington. So where did did he play? Was he a starter for them? Uh, yeah, he he started many games. Uh... You know, now, what's interesting, I don't know how much you know about uh, uh, Blue Washington, Edgar Blue Washington, but, you know, he appeared in over 40 motion pictures. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Matter of fact, uh, he's in the original Angels in the Outfield. No kidding. Yeah. But now you know, this is the kind of, this is the kind of stuff. He, he would have bit pieces. He'd be a usher or he'd be a, a Pullman uh, conductor or He'd that be is, a, uh, nice. you know, so he would get parts like that. Uh, he's in a movie with John Wayne at Western. Uh, he was in Gone with the Wind. He's in several Tarzan movies. Blue oh, Washington was in Gone with the Wind. Yes. No kidding. Yeah, look, <laughs> look him up, Edgar. Edgar Blue Washington. I will. Uh, I'm going to put you back on here, Phil. I, 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 that's that. That this is the kind of stuff that just like. Uh, the stories that people need to know because, uh, you know, if this was 2020 and Edgar Blue Washington was on the Kansas City Royals and he was going to do a movie with, um, you know, Matthew McConaughey, <laughs> people would know about it today. Yes, you could do. bet they would. Uh, but you can't 19... get much bigger, huh? You can't get much bigger than John Wayne. In, uh, exactly. In John Wayne that, that's back, what I'm saying. Back in the 30s and the 40s. Come on, that's, that's right. big. That's right. So, yo, know, but yet, who knew? Who knew that story that you just said that Edgar Blue Washington was uh, acting in movies with John Wayne in Gone with the Wind? I mean, that, that stuff is that, this is the kind of stuff. I guess I, I could talk to you about this until the sun matter, comes up. Matter of fact, if you come to my website, one of my blogs is about Edgar Blue Washington. So, yeah, cool. you can, yeah, you go there. Now, here's another one that you didn't mention. Did you have Hugh Blackburn? Yeah, you Blackburn's on here. Let me let me put that put that back up and find it. He is on here. Let's take a look at Hugh. Uh, they have him listed as a pitcher, but he could also play a little bit of position player, first base, and right field. 
Uh, let's see what his numbers were for the. So he played in 1920, pitched in a few games. Didn't see. Okay, so let, let me let me ask you this question, right? I'm looking at statistics here for Hugh Blackburn that only show him playing in six games, going 0 and 3. What do you What do you have research of? Okay. Let me, let me tell you about, Hugh wasn't there long. Now, Hugh was a originally a member of the Tennessee Rats. Oh, yeah. I love the Tennessee Rats. The, they were a barnstorming team, yeah. So, and they were out of Holden, Missouri, by the way. It had nothing to do with Tennessee. And Walter Brown was the owner of the team. And Walter Brown was a musician. If you look over, over my shoulder, you'll see a trumpet, actually an old coronet. And you I'm a musician, right? So I, I took a lot of interest in the Browns, Tennessee Rats, and their brass band. And the Hugh, Hugh Blackburn played back coordinator there, yeah. in the brass band. I and see so, that back so there. What they would do, yeah, what they would do is they would come into town. This is pre-night uh, baseball. So they would play baseball in the daytime. And then they would give what they call a shiitake or a play, a minstrel show at nighttime in the local theater. So mm -hmm. they combine uh, the theater along with the baseball and gave you two for one. So that was Walter Brown's Tennessee Rats, and Walter Brown was a cornet player. And like I say, I actually play trumpet too. So <laughs> and, and coming out of the pandemic, guys, uh, when I go out to speak, you will be hearing me play some uh, music, this time on my trumpet solo. Cool. Cool, cool. Uh, yeah, th these uh, these kind of stories, I mean, people need to hear them. Uh, I think it's just it's just fascinating. Wasn't wasn't Tank Carr? He used to put down actor as his profession. Wasn't he into? Know, uh, uh, he was from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he actually. I don't know what movies he actually appeared in, but I know Chet Brewer, and I know this Chet Brewer appeared in a few Tarzan movies because I was out there and uh, Buster Hayward. And yeah. Chet Brewer took me over to Buster Hayward's house. And uh, so I'm sitting there listening to him, and Buster says, did you tell him about the time you played in the Tarzan movie? And he <laughs> says, I don't want to talk about that. So <laughs> I, I don't know what movie it was. Uh, and then Mew Suttles was reportedly in a movie, I'm No Angel, with Mae West. Really? Um, really? Yeah, so yeah, a, few, a few guys snuck in there. But yeah, the Chet Brewer one is uh, one that, once again, I heard the guys talking. <laughs> But, you know, they didn't give me any details. And uh, Chet Brewer was also an, another uh, good supporter of mine early on. You know, uh, heck, of a, fact, I, heck of a pitcher. Can I close a couple of Chet Brewer stories tonight? I don't know. I, I, don't, we, I don't think we've touched on him, but he was a heck of a, of a pitcher. I know that. Yeah. Well, you know, he was, he was more than what people know, and I'll tell you why. Chet Brewer at age four. Uh, in, he lived in Leavenworth, Kansas. His, he had three toes decapitated when a trolley car ran over his foot. He's four years old. He, and so uh, they thought about amputating his foot. And there was a black doctor there in Leavenworth uh, who was a specialist, and he saved Chet Brewer's foot. And so in so doing, Chet Brewer pitched his entire career missing three toes on the Foot that you step down the pitching. So he pitched essentially with a handicap. Mm -hmm. And uh, so all the things he achieved were done with that handicap. But just imagine this. Just imagine if they had uh, if they had amputated Chip Brewer's foot. Yeah, changes and everything. Think about what he did later on as a, as a coach. And well, first of all, what he did as a player. But then he goes out to Los Angeles after his career is over and he starts to Chip Brewer rookie. And he developed players and sends them to the major leagues, like uh, 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 let's see, Roy Roy White, uh, Bobby Stoller, mm -hmm. uh, Bob uh, uh, Watson. Wow, uh, those are some big names Parker. right there. Yeah, uh, let's see. How about uh, Doc Ellis? No kidding. Those are all. all those are all pretty, pretty solid field. players. Let me tell you. Yeah, oh yeah, they you know they. Well, Bob Watson scored baseball's one million run, and Doc Ellis threw a no hitter. Bobby Tolan. I love Bobby Tolan. Bobby Tolan, left-handed hitter. He he was a terrific player. Bobby Tolan. Yeah. yeah. 
Yep. So just imagine if they amputate that four year old's foot. Changes everything. Yep. Life changing so, uh, situation, that's for sure. Yep. Yeah. Very so, cool. And, and you know, years years later in nineteen eighty seven, Chip used to tell me the story as we get in detail about, you know, his life. And I went out to Los Angeles and I stayed at Chip Brewer's house. And uh so, you know, I'm I'm there at the house and Chip's there. I said, Chip, I said, you've got to do one thing for me. You've got to show me the foot. So <laughs> Chip, Chip Brewer showed me his foot. So I can tell you that I've actually seen Chip. You verified. I, I verified it. And, you know, coming up, you know, I followed the A, Kansas City A. And, you know, uh, Catfish Hunter was also missing toes. I don't know if you knew that. I did not. <laughs> Anyway, just just great baseball history. You love baseball. Oh, you know, yeah, these these I kinds of that, stories. But I, but I really love the stories. Absolutely, and, and Phil, let me tell you what. Thank you so much for coming on here. This this was great. Uh, I really enjoyed it. It was a, this was a lot of fun, and and the stories and and I will keep doing my part. I, I know you will. <laughs> to try to yeah. get as many of these uh, stories out there and people out there. So we've got next week, let me see, I've got um, Donna Muscarella is a uh, photographer. She's done a, a card set on uh, Hinchcliffe Stadium and, and some other work. I, I'm going to talk to her about uh, how she got involved in that, and, and that should be a, a lot of fun. Uh, Greg Kreindler, the artist, is going to be on next week. He's done that. Uh, 184 cards set for the Negro Leagues of all the, the players, plus many of his works are in the Baseball Hall of Fame, and his, his work is just phenomenal. Uh, we're going to have on Dr. James Brunson, uh, who's done several books on, on um, baseball Negro League history. Um, then following that, Scott Simkis of Seamheads, who's a researcher and has done a lot of work on digging for these old box scores and, and another fascinating dude that I could, I could hardly wait to talk to. Uh, and so, you know, I'm going to keep these keep these going, and I'm going to have some former players on. I'm going to have uh, other artists, other researchers, other historians. Uh, Larry Lester is coming on on the 18th. So, yeah, so, I, you know, I want to keep lining these up and keep getting you guys out there and, and uh, uh, do my, my little bit here. I mean, this is my amateur radio hour, but, I, you know, it, it, it's it, – I'm surprised. There's been a lot of people that have really enjoyed these, so I'm glad. I, I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, and I look I look forward to sharing it uh, on my uh, awesome. social media. Yep. And uh, hey, it sounds like you got a lot of good guests coming up, and uh, mm -hmm. it, you know it's been a fun conversation. And uh, I'd say you know it, you know so many things are bouncing through my head. I know I mentioned Rush Limbaugh. Yep. And I started yep. thinking about it. you know Rush Limbaugh was from Cape Girardeau, Missouri, right? And the Monarchs used to go through there, and they would play the Cape Girardeau Kappa Hall, right? Uh -huh. The Kappa, the Kappa Halls had Rush Limbaugh. It was about two or three Limbaugh's that played for the Kappa Halls that the Monarchs played against all the time. So you know, these are things that, you know, you start talking, you start thinking about things you don't get a uh -huh. chance to talk about too often. But, you know, it's, so anyway, it's, it's been a pleasure. It's been my pleasure. This was great. I appreciate it. And maybe down the road, we'll get you on here again. And, and you know, keep on. Uh, uh, I want to see volume two soon, hopefully, <laughs> of your yep. American Baseball Chronicles. Whatever else you got coming out. And whatever else you got coming out, I'll, I'll make sure I try to get it out there in front of people and, and point them to in your direction, man. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, we'll have to do it again after Abs after you've exhausted all of those great guests. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. You were, you were more and, than... You are more than welcome. To turn in. You are more than welcome to come on here again and, and talk. I, I just want to close with this because it blows me away that we probably cross paths. I could have been standing next to you 30 years ago. I don't know. But in 1992, and here we are in 2021 at that event in in Lackawanna County Stadium in Pennsylvania, that, that kind of blew me away when you told me you were there. <laughs> that is That is so cool. All right, man. You have a good night. I appreciate it. All right. To you too. And take it easy. And congratulations on the show. And I will continue to watch. All right. Thank you, sir. Have a good night. Bye-bye.